morning. Welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. I have had a blessed day thus far. As you rose from your bed, a good night's rest. Come here this morning, as we all have, to worship the Lord, to give ourselves over to worship to Him, for He truly is worthy of our worship. The worship folders that we're going to be using are in your pew. Um, they're distributed around. If you don't have one, just kind of raise your hand or ask someone who will pass you one. I know they're kind of distributed and in some pews they might not have as many as you need on the pew. So uh, someone will uh, gladly get one to you. On the back page of uh, the worship folder this morning, I would just point out one thing, and that is if you're interested, the Central Georgia Presbytery uh, is meeting this week on Tuesday. Uh, always, as often as I bring that to your attention, uh, please pray. These are always interesting meetings when you get a bunch of preachers and elders together to uh, deliberate and, and decide things relating to the work of God in our general area. So please be in prayer for the Central Georgia Presbytery meetings on Tuesday at the North Bacon Presbyterian Church. Well, we've gathered here this morning to worship the Lord and let us look to Him during this prayer. and the elders in a loud voice they sang worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped let us our Heavenly Father, as we gather in this earthly setting on this Lord's Day, it is amazing to read what we just read in Revelation 5 of that which is transpiring in the heavenly places surrounding your throne of glory, wherein there are so many angels and, and elders and, and others who are all gathered in unison. And with one voice they are crying out to you that you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And so, uh, Father, receive the praise we bring to you this morning. As they are praising you in the heavenly places, so we are praising you in this place. And may your name be blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing and you'll find the words to our first hymn in the hymnal number 457. Come now found a deadly blessing and then we'll 
move on into the words printed in the bulletin, Jesus on my cross had taken.
shall close thy earthly mission, soon shall pass thy pilgrim's days, hope shall change to glad fruition, faith to sight, prayer to praise. A wonderful way of expressing our glorious hope today that our mission, our journey, this life will be over and we will be home with the Lord. But in the meantime, what do we find ourselves doing? Well, seeking to serve God, loving Him, wanting to do His will and obey His commands. But we all here honestly know of ourselves, don't we? That we sin, we fall short of what we're called to do. So God tells us that we ought to humble ourselves, pray to Him, confess our sins, and be forgiven, and press on. Join with me as we go to the Lord in Father, we sing gladly of this great hope that You have given to us. One day, we will no longer walk by faith, but we will walk by sight. We will behold You, O Lord, in all of Your glory. We will dwell in a place where there is the absolute absence of sin. But in the meantime, Lord, on our pilgrim's way here in this earth, on this journey, on this mission, as we have just sung, Lord, we look to You for Your grace and mercy. Because though we love You, You have given us understanding of Your teachings and Your commands, Lord. Because of our fallen nature, because of the battle that we sometimes lose with it and sin, we humble ourselves now, Lord. And each of us, now in the quiet of our hearts, we turn to You. we ask, O Lord, is that according to your kindness and mercy, that you forgive us. We know you do because you're a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping Lord. And we are thankful for the grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. In his blessed name we pray. Amen. Words of assurance that are in your folder this morning are taken from Psalm 25. A beautiful, beautiful reminder of God's grace and forgiveness. Let us in unison be reminded of this truth. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore He instructs sinners in His ways. He guides the humble in what is right. He teaches them His way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of His covenant. For the sake of Your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity. Though it is great. Though it is great. Sometimes our iniquity is huge. But God still forgives. As believers in the Lord this morning, we're confessing the faith that the Scriptures have taught us to believe in and continue to profess. Using the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 29 and 30, a focus on the exclusive nature of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinners. So I'll ask questions 29 and 30 if you would please respond with the answer in unison. Question 29. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, that is, Savior? Because He saves us from all our sins. Because salvation is not to be sought or found Question 30. Do those really believe in the only Savior, Jesus, who seek their salvation and well-being from saints? In themselves or anywhere else? in worship before your throne of grace this morning with our prayers we bring them before you in Jesus name yes that is Jesus name the only 
the only one under heaven that you have said is the way of salvation and him alone for he is the one and only mediator of this new covenant and father we are glad and well pleased to come in our savior's name for by your grace you have taught us the true way of salvation you have taught us to believe in christ alone to exercise our faith in what he has done what his work is all about the cross his burial his resurrection and his ascension and so father in his blessed name do we come in prayer this morning father we are concerned for the world around us it is obvious to us as we look around that there are so many in this world who are far outside of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have no true saving knowledge of Christ. They have never repented of their sins. They have never turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and confessed His name and repented. And Father, we think of these very often. And that is why we are thankful as a congregation as it would relate to those who are so far away from us here in Valdosta that we can have some of an impact in their lives. We think this morning of Derek and Catalina Kreider, who have gone to the country of Romania with Mission to the World. We pray you get them back to that country. As far as we know, they're still here. We know they're desirous of returning, but the COVID situation certainly has thrown a monkey wrench perhaps into their plans. But we pray soon you would speed them on their way so that they can get back to the place where you've called them, the Romanian people, where they now know the language and are accustomed to the culture and can minister in your name and share your gospel and build up your church in that country. Father, we pray for our congregation here at Redeemer, and I would lift up our elders who will be meeting on tomorrow night. And just simply ask on behalf of this congregation, Lord, that you would bless these men, open their eyes, cause them to be men of great faith, looking to you, for these are a difficult times to lead your church. So many issues that were unexpected are before us, and Lord, we ask that you grant these men your wisdom as they deliberate and decide how best to move forward in these times. We also pray for the Central Georgia Presbytery, which will be meeting this coming Tuesday up in Bacon. We pray for the men who will be representing all of their churches in our presbytery. We pray that all would go well. And likewise, it's difficult to do the work of a presbytery during these challenging times. So grant the presbytery meeting wisdom and discernment. Father, we look to you on behalf of those who are still not very well. Our sister Esther Marie Lawrence is continuing in her battle with COVID-19. We Continue to receive good little tidbits of encouraging news from her. We lift her before your throne of grace and mercy that you might heal her body completely. Father, we also uh, think of, in general, this pandemic that is all around us here in our community, all around our nation, and all around the world. Father, we pray that you might intervene divinely. Oh, Father, you can bring this to an end. You could cause it to receive. And Father, we pray that you would do that, if it would be your will, that, that many a life would be spared and many a, a sickness could be avoided. Oh, Father, help us as a nation of people to do what is right, just, good, and true when we think of our responsibility as citizens of the United States of America. And finally, Father, we close our prayers remembering all of our fellow citizens on the west coast of this great nation. Places like California and Oregon and, and Arizona and Washington State where wildfires are burning out of control. Homes are being destroyed. Lives are being lost. Father, we thank you for those brave firefighters who are there doing battle with those flames. We pray that uh, these fires might be brought under control. Lord, we would even pray to the end that you would cause rain. Yes, Lord, bring rain to the West Coast, that that would help in controlling Lord, we look to you in all things. We bring these prayers before you. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from 
the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. In Proverbs 17, we're going to be looking at the issue of contentment. Well, Jesus Christ uh, certainly had quite a bit to say about the issue of contentment in His Sermon on the Mount. Listen closely, beginning in verse 25 of chapter 6 of the book of Matthew, what Jesus says. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? But why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own beautiful, powerful teachings of Jesus Christ. Only He could say like that. We're now going to give tithes and offerings to our Lord. We have a plate here in the front of the sanctuary, a plate in the rear of the sanctuary, and you're more than welcome to deposit your tithes and offerings in either of those places.
invite you to take your copy of God's Word and we'll take the Old Testament book of Proverbs. We've been camped out here for a little while and a little more work to do with this volume of wisdom. Uh, this morning, the 17th chapter, is a chapter once again that's filled with these little two-line proverbial quips, you might call them, and Solomon with his machine gun of wisdom, rat tat tat tat, he just kind of reels off any number of them. We're going to be looking at uh, six of these verses between verse 1 and, and verse 17, and I'm going to be reading them as you can see, uh, verse 1, 3, 6, 8, 10, and 17, because these seem as a body when you combine them together to have this in common. We're talking about contentment. That's the subject we're going to investigate this morning. I hear the word of the Lord. Proverbs 17, verse 1 says, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Verse 3. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Verse 6. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Verse 8. A bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. Verse 10. A rebuke impresses a man of discernment. More than a hundred lashes a fool. Finally, verse 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. This is the reading of this portion of God's holy and infallible word. I began this morning with an American proverb. It goes like this, if the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, you can bet the water bill is higher. <laughs> you can bet on it. You can probably even cash the check, right? And the water bill is going to be higher. See, contentment is a life issue before us this morning. We all know that this is reality, is it not? That we're all tempted to gaze at the other side of the fence, aren't we? We are tempted to gaze at that so-called greener grass, even if we know that if we jump the fence and go over, that we'll pay the higher water bill. But yet we still battle with that temptation to go from where we are called to be and even know we're called to be and be content in that place and to long for, seek, and sometimes stumble into a place where God would not want us to be. So the challenge before us this morning is are we winning against such a temptation? And are we winning against such a temptation by applying the wisdom of God? Solomon has more of this wisdom for us this morning, especially when we think of content. You see, the believer who is truly content, in my opinion, has discovered this secret. That what I'm doing in my life is I'm wholly and entirely trusting in God. And to the extent that by God's grace I can wholly and entirely trust Him for all things at all times will I find myself blessed with contentment. Let me ask, how valuable is contentment? Well, I did a little searching on the internet for some statistics that sociologists have come up with on the issue of contentment. And they have found that nearly two-thirds of workers are not content with their job. When you press them to be honest about their job, almost two-thirds say, I don't like it. Many a marriage struggles due to what? Due to a lack of contentment. I would say contentment is, is valuable. I would say if you want to put it in monetary terms, it's more, more valuable than a million shares of Apple Computer. I mean, it is incredibly valuable. But here's the reality. So many people yearn for it, but seemingly few experience it. So many yearn for it. Few have the experience of it. Why? I think the answer to that question, why, is obvious. They are looking for contentment in all the wrong places. How many are the places that we can find ourselves looking for, searching for contentment, only to find what? It's just not there, though we thought it would be there. Well, Solomon tells us precisely where and how we can find contentment. And it has to do with trusting God as we trust in and apply God's wisdom. Trusting God and how would we pragmatically show that we're trusting God? 
Well, we would understand his wisdom. When life's decisions come, we would apply that wisdom. So we're going to examine six issues in our lives this morning, which truly test our level of contentment. Each of these verses that I read in Proverbs 17, each of these holds forth that this is an area where your contentment is being tested. We're going to look at satisfaction, trials, parenting, integrity, correction, and finally love. Well, let's get started because we've got a lot of ground to go. Let's get started by looking at contentment as it would relate to whether or not we are satisfied with what we currently have. Verse 1, better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with straw. Now Solomon contrasts two life experiences by saying, let's go to the dinner table of the average family. Let's sit down at that table and let's see what's going on in this particular family. The first part of the portrait of this dinner table scenario that Solomon paints is a life of satisfaction unto contentment. And that maybe I don't have everything I want, Maybe I don't have everything I want. Oh, I was hoping for a, a better dinner, but what we have on the table is a dry crust. I don't have everything I want, but I do have this. I have peace. Because I'm resting in what God has provided, though it be but a dry crust. And I have quietude because I'm trusting God instead of worrying. And articulating my worry by complaining. That's the portrait of a life of satisfaction and contentment over and against a life of superficial satisfaction that is terrorized by discontent. Look at all that I have, but still so much. I've got plenty. My life is chocked full of all kinds of things and stuff. But what is the reality of my life? There is so much strife. Or maybe all I'm doing in life is always fighting for more and that is causing consternation on my part and strife and anxiety in the lives of other people around me. So the issue of satisfaction with what we have how practical could Solomon possibly be when he brings this to our attention? Philippians 4, verses 12 and 13. If you have not yet marked this in your Bible or dog-eared this particular testimonial by Paul, please do this morning. This is what Paul says of his own self concerning contentment. He says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. So Paul said, by God's grace, I found this secret. I'm looking to God and I'm satisfied with, with God. We all know who the Puritans were, right? These were these God-fearing, zealous, and very pious people who were some of the very original settlers from Europe and England and the British Isles. And they came to the New World in the 1600s because they wanted to escape religious persecution. They wanted to be able to live for the Lord and practice Christianity as they knew the Bible called them to. And, and they were very pious and very concerned about their sanctification and there was a Puritan one time it is said who sat down to his meal and he found that he only had a little bread and a cup of water for dinner his response was what I get all of this and I have Jesus Christ too now there there's an example of being satisfied with exactly what God in that moment has provided. That's what God's wisdom is for us when we think of satisfaction. 
And we don't know what all God might bring our way in the next day, week, month, or year, but we do know what He's brought our way now, right? The call upon the life of God's people is to be satisfied with what we have. Let's move on and talk about contentment in verse 3 when Solomon introduces the fact that we are called to stand up when we are tried. During the hard times in life. Verse 3, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. We all know of this analogy, right? It appears not just here, but in other places in the Old Testament. It's used by uh, New Testament authors as a way of helping us understand what God is doing in our life. When He allows trials, tribulations, persecutions, and difficulties of all kinds to come our way. We know that what Solomon is talking about is the purification of, of very precious metals like gold and, and silver. And so the silversmith or the goldsmith, in order to what? Get rid of the purification, of the, impure, the impurities I mean, to get rid of these, uh, he would take these metals and he would melt them down and put them under intense heat and the impurities would rise to the top and they would then be scooped off. Well, you see, God intends that we be tested. He intends that we find ourselves sometimes in this life in the crucible with the intense heat brought to bear on our life. That our hearts be put to the test. But why does God do this? We know why the goldsmith and the silversmith does what he does. Why does God do what he does when he allows this to happen? Well, he wants us to learn. He wants us to learn to persevere. He wants us to learn to persevere by faith. The reason I can say that so emphatically is because the Apostle James comes along in his wonderful letter. And in James 1, he adds meat to the bones of verse 3 in Proverbs 17 and says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. So listen to me closely. Contentment in the face of trials is found in knowing this, that God is teaching me to depend on Him. He's teaching me to look to Him. To put my faith, to put my trust in Him. And that is one of the glorious ways that God makes us more like Jesus Christ. Might I ask, what trial are you undergoing? I don't know. These are strange times. It's the year 2020. What else could come upon us? Are you content? Am I content? What is God teaching you? As maybe He's knocked the bed slaps right out of your life in some area. Trust me, God has turned the heat up because He's teaching us. He's teaching you to rely more and more on Him. And as we would look at these difficulties in life and find that, okay, God, you're teaching me something, oh, guess what? I guess I can be content in knowing that, right, God? Knowing that you are up to my own very good. Let's move on and talk about parent. Yes, verse 6. This is an amazing proverb. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Yeah, let's talk about contentment in relationship to godly parenting. Now Solomon's getting very personal now, isn't he? He's talking about what parenting has to do. He speaks in terms of a tri-generational scenario, does he not, in verse 6? 
And this is basically the portrait that Solomon paints. It's a glowing portrait of how parenting should be according to the Lord. And this is how portrait is painted. You have a grandparent, a grandparent, that's right, a grandparent's godly efforts in parenting their children. These ways of parenting are then mimicked by their children's godly parenting, their children, and the grandkids, according to Solomon, are the crowning results. The aged, the uh, the older grandparents now look at these grandchildren who have had the same kind of parenting applied to their lives as they apply to their own children's lives and it is unto the grandparents a crowning achievement, a crown. And he goes on and he says, and the children are so blessed that they beam with pride towards mom and dad. They look at their mother and dad and they say, I am so thankful. I am so filled with pride over you because you've done such a wonderful, blessed, godly job of parenting. Well, let's pause here for a second. Is this even possible? You know what I'm asking. Is this even possible? Or is Solomon now, this is pie in the sky. Man, you have left the planet, buddy. You were practical, but now you're impractical. Well, Think about this with me for a moment. And the answer to the question, is this even possible? Well, you see, contentment is the key to godly parenting. It has to be the key to godly parenting. Teaching your children to trust in God by demonstrating your own trust in God. As you show forth to your children what it means to be content, that will influence them so when it comes time for them to raise their children, hopefully by God's grace, they will employ the same kind of contentment toward their children, your grandchildren. I want to quote Socrates, the great philosopher of, of Athens, who lived centuries and centuries ago. This is what Socrates said one day to the people of the great city of Athens. He says, Why do you turn and scrape every stone to gather wealth and take so little care of your children to whom one day you must relinquish all? Now the Greeks were a very sophisticated, wealthy, uppity kind of civilization. And their great philosopher Socrates said, but don't you understand there's something more than just this work, work, work and hustle, bustle and run around and, and doing all these kinds of things. Don't you understand the wisdom, Socrates is saying, the wisdom of investing in your children so that in the generations to come there might be a blessing. Something to think about. Contentment as it relates to godly parenting. Let's look in verse 8. Verse 8 says, A bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. So contentment now butts up against moral integrity. Solomon ushers into our hearts and minds the issue of moral integrity. You see, moral integrity and contentment excuse me, are always seemingly on a collision course. The temptation to succeed by bending the rules is what Solomon is saying is the vice of many people. He talks about bribery. I want to get my way. I want you to see it my way. I want you to do something for me. So how about if I sweeten the pot of your wallet? How about if I bribe you? How about if I induce you by way of monetary gain so that I can get what, what I want? And there's plenty of opportunity to buy our way to the world's definition of success, isn't there? Plenty of opportunity to do it the way the world does it. But what is really being exposed here and what Solomon says? 
I'll tell you what's really being exposed here. I'm not patient enough to uphold integrity over greed. I'm just not patient enough. I, just, I can't do that waiting game. I can't wait anymore. I've got to bend the rules. I've got to find the shortcut. I've got to jump over the fence. I've got to get my way. So much for moral integrity. Listen to what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He said in verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. I'm confident in my own life and I'm confident in your life that we could avoid a whole lot of falling by way of not practicing moral integrity if we were content. Content to do it God's way and take it as God is bringing things into our life, not trying to run ahead of God and make something happen that is not supposed to be happening. Let's move on and look at verse 10. Contentment as it relates to the willingness or lack thereof to be corrected. Oh boy, verse 10. A rebuke impresses a man of discernment more than a hundred lashes a fool. Well, what principle is Solomon speaking of here? Simply put, a person's reaction to being corrected is a true barometer of their contentment. How do we respond? How do we react when we get corrected, rebuked, told that what you're doing is not right? It's not of God. How do we respond? Well, Solomon points out the obvious, doesn't he? A content person wants to learn. A man and woman of discernment. They want to learn. They're humble enough to realize, okay, I've done it wrong. I should not have approached it in that fashion. should not have said what I said, done what I did. And I want to learn from it. I don't want to keep making that same kind of mistake. While a discontent person is oblivious to their need to learn. Solomon says that the man or woman who is not content, who has little if any discernment, will just say, keep on whooping me. I'll take 50 of your lashes. I'll take 75 of your lashes. I'll take 100 of your lashes. Fine with me. I'm not changing anything. They're oblivious to their need to learn. Well, how do we react to correction? Remember to be content. Remember that God would correct you. He would bring correction into your life because once again, He's teaching you something. He's teaching me something. He doesn't just correct us for the sake of correcting us. He wants us to live more and more on the narrow way. Let me share with you an example from my life going back many years to the year 1986. When I had my first major experience of needing to be corrected in, and this is what happened. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia in 1986. I was an intern at a small church. I was in charge, essentially, of the college ministry at this church. And I started dating one of the students from Agnes Scott College who was in the group. Now, I was 23 and she was 20, so there was only three years. That was the first part of my rationale. There was only three years age difference. Boy, correction came my way. Because the associate pastor who I worked closely with, oh, he found out about it. He so said he was not too happy. And I mean, he took me out to the proverbial switch said, what in the world are you doing? The college ministry intern does not date the college students. I don't care how good looking the girls are at Agnes Scott. You don't date them. You go to the cafeteria and share the gospel with them. 
You might lead a Bible study where there's a bunch of them at one time in one place, but you don't go to basketball games with them by yourself. He just laid into me. And I remember sitting there, and I, this is what I was thinking. My whole future in the ministry is hanging in the balance based on how I'm about to react to this rebuke, this correction. Was I going to go for the girl? Was I going to go for the girl? Was I going to tell this man? I don't care what you say. Keep whooping me. Keep, keep whooping me. I'm going for the girl. Or was I going to receive the correction? By God's grace, I received the correction. And moved on. That was a wake-up moment for me as a young believer. When it comes to the wisdom of being content enough to know, Lord, you really were teaching me something in that moment about your correction in my life. Let's move on and, and look at look at love. The final, the final point that Solomon makes as we look at verse 17. Solomon goes on and says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So contentment as it relates to the practice of unconditional love. Solomon commends to us a kind of love that overcomes adversity. He says there's a kind of love that God's people can practice one towards another that literally becomes the strong bedrock foundation of lasting friendships. In other words, it's the kind of love that when something that is adverse is brought into the relationship, the relationship is not dashed on the rocks. It abides, it lasts, it endures because there's a different kind of love that is involved. Well, let me ask, how can you love a person at all times? Once again, back to the parenting thing. Is this even possible? <laughs> well, I believe we can love a person at all times if, if we have this kind of contentment. That we are secure in God's love for us. If we are content and secure in God's never-changing ever abiding love for us that nothing can ever be done about our relationship with God through Christ if we are content in God's love for us we will be more than willing to love other people even when they are very unlovely because we're not self-seeking in our love we don't have the perspective of what's in it for me we're willing to risk our love on someone else unconditionally because we know even if they spit in our face and tell us to get lost and I'm not your friend anymore, God still loves us. In the New Testament, there is a word for love. It has three basic definitions. One of the definitions is the Greek word agape, which means selfless or unconditional love. That's what Solomon is really speaking of here in verse 17. That if we are content in our love relationship with God, we can love a person at all times. 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Agape love. Those who are content can love without feeling like they're risking their esteem. Because guess what? Their esteem is in Christ. And all I'm doing is loving you like God's called me to love you. So Solomon beats the drum of the issue of contentment in, in many different ways, addressing a gamut of various issues in our life. And many have said wisdom and contentment are two sides of the same coin. It's the same coin. It has two sides. Flip it and it lands on wisdom. Turn it over and it says contentment. In other words, contentment and wisdom are connected at the hip. And I want to close with an illustration about a football player. 
Praise the Lord, football season appears to be on the move. I watched a decent college football game yesterday. Georgia Tech, Jackets, Florida State. Well, there's an offensive lineman named Glenn Parker who a couple of years ago was still playing for the Buffalo Bills. And in an interview, he speculated as to why NFL linemen are generally cheerful. And this is what Parker said. There are not a lot of well-paying jobs for 300-pound men. We found one, and we're happy about it. <laughs> now, he's probably pretty well compensated for his efforts, but I think you see what the man is saying. Content. God has us where he has us. He's moving us to where he wants us to be. In the meantime... Let's take this wisdom that Solomon gives us, let's apply it, and let's, let's live by it. Join with me in prayer. Father, again, your word has searched our hearts. It has tried our conscience. It has provoked us to a sense of knowing our need to change, or knowing our need to be less dependent on ourselves and more, more, more dependent upon you, wholly trusting in you, satisfied with what you have for us now, always, always leaning upon you. Father, I pray for myself chiefly. I pray for all who are within the hearing of my words right now. Father, that you would help us in this regard. This contentment thing is not easy. It really grates against our fallen nature. Lord, we need your grace to help us to be content so that we can have a testimony in this life that we are satisfied alone in Christ and in what you're doing in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and turn to the generals to hymn number 693 as we close out our worship singing, Blessed Assurance.